I'm Liza Loop. Um, the thing that makes me exciting for folks here at the Vintage Computer Festival is I have the first Apple computer, um, Apple One number one. It's not here today. It's in secure storage because the first thing everybody says to me is, oh, that's worth a lot of money. Unfortunately, it's not worth enough to, to fund the things that I'd like to do. Um, I, my, I'm, I'm the second of four generations of people interested in computing, and my particular area is computing and education, and by education I mean the large interpretation of education, not just schooling. Um, if you want to move over here, you can see the screen better. <laughs> Anybody else having trouble seeing? Uh, and of course, I don't know how, to, I'm not computer, this is a talk on computer literacy. Um, and today is sort of looking backward, and uh, Jerry Crispy just talked about um, uh, computer literacy and, and computers in computing and education in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. I'm going to go back to the 70s. Um, and then tomorrow I'm going to talk about what I think computer literacy would be in the future. Um, what else do I want to say about me? Um, my father was not, I don't, some of you were in the previous talk, um, my father was at MIT working on the other first computer, uh, the Whirlwind, um, and uh, I've gone into computing and education. My son has gone into visual effects and his son is in computing and art. So we know that introduction to computing works for several generations. Um, I could tell you more about myself, but that's not what you came to hear. Uh, what I want to do, actually, we want to go back one, um, is that, actually, these slides are pretty visible. I use the slides um, to guide myself in talking. There's more information than anybody will tell you to put on a slide, so please don't try to read the whole slide. And the, uh, so the source for each image is in tiny print on the slide. Don't try and read that. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but uh, enjoy these, and they will be on the web and available later. They're really the beginning of a conversation, not the end. So my point is we'll, we'll use these as guides, but don't feel like you have to read everything on it. Um, I probably didn't keep to the title Keepers and heap, Trash Heapers, uh, but... <laughs> We'll see at the end whether I made it or not. And of course, if we want to interrupt what we're doing and talk about something else, that's okay too. We'll just go with the flow. The other thing I want to admit is that uh, I've been trying to write this book for about 40 years, and I'm not going to get it done, no, 20 years. I'm not going to get it done by myself. So this is an uh, invitation for somebody, some of you, please come and save me. I need help writing this book. It's tentatively titled Future Flashback. And the idea is that we interview people who were teaching and in, trying to integrate uh, computing into learning in the 70s and 80s um, and interview them, talk about what, their, the, what they thought was the reality at the time, what they predicted, predicted for, thought was likely to happen within their lifetimes, within the next 25 years, and then what they thought was likely to happen in the next 50 years. So we interview the old guard and we interview the new guard, who are the people today who are those digital na natives that uh, Jerry talked about in last session. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, please see me afterwards. And um, I, I could use a couple of co-authors, and I'm willing to share authorship of this thing. I really want to get it written. I have lots of material. We need to do lots of interviews, and I think it would be a fun project. Let's go back to 1975 and what was happening. 75, a little earlier, a little later. Uh, in 64, Dartmouth introduced basic language, and all of the Students at Dartmouth had the opportunity to learn to program. Actually, all of them had to use the computer. This is the beginning of real computer uh, infiltration into schools. And of course, those graduates became, in many cases, the people who were interested in computers in the home as well. 
because they had that experience of using a computer uh, as a personal tool. Uh, and then everybody else jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, so there's a picture of the basic manual from 64. Um, Ted Nelson um, published Computer Lib and Dream Machines in 74, I think. Um, and uh, that was, again, a popular, does anybody see that book, that the, the picture here? At least one person in this audience has seen it. The rest of you might enjoy taking a look at it. Um, Ted is still with us. He's the inventor of HyperCard. And there are a bunch of ideas which still seem to be innovative that were being published back then. Part of the reason I work with computers, the history of computing, is because um, back in the early, late 60s, early 70s, we didn't have the power to do what we believed would be happening. So we got to blue sky and say, oh God, this is what we should do with computers in education, and this is how computing should support learning. Not just in schools, but learning for everybody. Um, and a lot of the things that we're just beginning to implement today um, were imagined then, and now we can do them, and that's just terribly exciting. So this other picture is a little girl who um, was at, I think this picture came from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. It was one of three places in the early 70s where you could get your hands on a computer by paying the museum entrance fee. There was Boston Children's Museum, there was Museum Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. And one of the people from the Dartmouth Project, Arthur Lerman, went to Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley. And they put a time-sharing machine there. And kids and adults could get time on the machine and could work with computing, um, play computer games. There weren't any personal computers. This was 1975. Um, you could open popular mechanics and order a mid altair but you had to know a lot in order to build it. And what could you do when it was built? You could play diddle with the lights on the screen. Um, this is also about computer literacy. By the way, my, my carefully crafted notes are not visible on the screen, so I'm going to say whatever comes to my mind when I see these slides. Um, Literacy, as you probably know, comes the word from litera, which is Latin for, for letter and word. And literacy used to be reading and writing. And you were literate if you could read and write. Then you were literate if you were well-read as well, and you knew a lot about things that were in writing. Then we expanded the term so that we talked about reading the waves. So the Polynesian sailors who could find the island because they could read the, the waves we talked about that being a kind of literacy. Most recently, jump way ahead to 2017, um, this one school district in Canada um, defined literacy as the ability, confidence, and willingness to engage with language, to acquire, construct, and communicate meaning in all aspects of daily living. So not just reading and writing. So that leads us to, well, what was computer literacy when Computers were just beginning to be able to be available to the general public. And again, tomorrow we'll talk about what's computer literacy today. Well, Arthur Lerman um, was a big proponent of you can't be computer literate unless you, are, uh, you can program. Um, so this, this was a paper from, what's the date, in 72, 76? 72, April 72, that's in the, in the notes on the bottom that you can't read. Um, and although when I knew him and we were arguing about what was computer literacy and what, would you, what, what should we teach to people, um, he'd already published this paper, which is more general than what he was actually practicing, which was teaching programming. So getting information from databases, well, that's pretty obvious, but at that time, um, you had to do a pretty sophisticated query search, which was pretty much like today's coding. You had to understand logic, Boolean logic, in order to get a library computer database to give you the data that you wanted. Um, simulation, yeah, we had simulation programs back then. 
um, the Huntington Project that was published by Deck early in the very early late 60s and early 70s. The simulation part was it did the mathematical calculations for you. So if you were doing a population study, it would calculate the probabilities of this and that happening. But what you got was a paper manual that uh, had the basic language program in it, and you typed that into your computer. Again, that's more programming and less of the results of the simulation. And I, I searched for a, a good picture of um, the Weather Channel's live experience, the weather as if it was live. Um, kind of simulation. And of course, we didn't have that today uh, in the 70s. Um, he said, Lerman says solve problems by using algorithms. But he didn't really say whose algorithms. I mean, we're still we're solving problems using algorithms. But what we wanted was to um, have the learner understand, to be computer literate, what an algorithm is and how to construct one. <coughs> and then how to encode it. Um, again, programming as computer literacy. Um, how to acquire library, laboratory data and analyze it, same thing. You gotta program the computer to get that stuff. You can't just, you, you don't have um, a laboratory instrument you can plug in that will collect the data and analyze it for you. Um, I, I, the textual information, a lot of that, the text was the computer program. <laughs> That was a high, basic was a high level language. And what you got was Tico uh, or Focus, which you had to program in. There were no word processors. I went to Atari in, to write the original user's manuals in 1978 and went to the Consumer Electronics Show in January of 79 with the manual that I wrote. There was no word processor for me to write that manual on. I used Tico. <laughs> to write that manual. And when I went to buy a book on computer, on word processing, it was a book on how to program your own word processor. It was not a word processor. <laughs> I think the first real word processor I used was WordStar. Um, textual information. Musical information, same thing. It was, it was a big deal to get the computer to make sounds beyond 25 beeps. Um, there was no voice. Uh, we were not programming, programming music. Um, later, we had file sharing. We had Napster. But think about it. Um, the guy that, that founded Napster was born in 1979. We didn't have file sharing and a controversy about that um, until the mid-'80s. Uh, so again, I'm not sure what, what Art was talking about when he said musical information and analysis of musical information, but I suspect it was more programming and, and numerical analysis than it was what we think of as using computing for music today. Um, and then he was talking about creating and processing graphical information. Okay, that's graphical information of the time. Um, we're talking about typewriter graphics. We're talking about how many X's you have to put down. And there were some fantastic graphics at the time, but, um, but it wasn't what we're talking about today. So you could be really computer literate, and that meant writing a program that would generate this kind of a picture. Um, of course, does anybody here know why the key on the right-hand side of your computer is called the return key? Anybody old enough to remember this? See that bar? That's carriage return. They, they left out line feed. We automatically do line feed. But it used to be that you had to, to demand, to program in carriage return and line feed to get this thing to print out anything. <laughs> uh, another issue about computer literacy at the time, very important issue, was that what we were teaching as computer literacy, what we were teaching to, the, to both children and adults, this was not just in schools. Um, what I forgot to say, because my notes aren't here, um, when we were talking about who uh, got to use computers and where you could access them was, in 1975, there were three museums where you could access them in the US and two public access computer centers, storefront computer centers. One was People's Computer Company that Bob Albrecht started. 
uh, early on. And uh, the other was Loop Center, which I started modeling after People's Computer Center. So that was 1975. But when we taught computer literacy and promoted computer literacy, what we taught when you got on the computer was sort of cognitively less challenging than how to get the computer to do anything. So um, we had to have a, a conditioned phone line because we're time sharing. We had to have a timeshare account. We had to have an ac acoustic coupler to put the voice into uh, the, the phone that supposedly was optimized for transmitting voice to, to transmit beeps and bops um, reliably enough so that it would go down the audio phone line, be demodulated at the other end, go into the computer. Um, so in some senses, people couldn't, unless you were a hobbyist or a, a professional, you couldn't really use this stuff, and teachers certainly were terribly intimidated by this, <coughs> unless you had a whole lot of other information and know-how to get connected to the computer, because, of course, you're using a teletype even if it's a glass teletype, even if it's an ADM3, you're still using a dumb terminal, not the computer itself, for most of the access. And again, if you're using an, the, the Altair or an Imzai, you're, you're often dealing in octal or binary, and you have to, I had DEX, you had to load it. I do, the previous uh, talk had a picture of a DEC PDP-8 with the flip, flip switches on the front. And uh, Jerry said he didn't know how to, what those were for. He never touched them. Well, I knew how to do it in Octal because you had to put the bin loader in before you could get the computer to work. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that wasn't even included in what was called computer literacy that was necessary in order to get access. Um, so why did we want to use computers in education? Um, we've got the Oregon Trail on the front of our brochures. Um, the Oregon Trail had what I call um, redeeming educational value because there was some educational content and um, formal educators hoped that you would remember something about the Oregon Trail, but what do you guys remember? <laughs> yeah, whether you died of dysentery or not. Yeah, 95% of the people who played Oregon Trail, do not remember the names of the cities or where, it, where the Oregon Trail was. It's, did you shoot things and could you die of dysentery? It was, it, we called it redeeming an educational value, but it really wasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the computer was, was a laboratory for learning about computing. So if that's what you wanted to learn about, you learned programming, you learned how to operate the computer, you learned how to get the damn thing to talk to the the, the d dumb terminal to talk to the timeshare computer. Um, and it was a motivator. Why did kids play Oregon Trail? It wasn't because they wanted to learn about history. It was because they wanted to play with the computer. Um, this, this happens to be, a, by the way, this was word processing at the time, um, all caps, I had Moonshadow. I, I, I was able to write in lower case if I attached a dumb terminal to my Apple. Um, and uh, thermal paper, put it, put, it in a, in, put it away or it's gone. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, it's like, why become, com it, it was almost a farce what you were becoming computer literate about if all you thought about was programming. Um, so, in that context, I developed a computer, computer play shop curriculum for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Or, and, and I was teaching people of all ages, but this became kind of the, the gold standard for me of the different things that we did. Um, one of the things we did was we did pre and post tests because I wanted to find out whether we were having any effect on the people that, were, um, that we were teaching. And the pre and post tests were for the school program that I did. It was a two-week, half-day, five days, so it was 40-hour um, course in, quote, computer literacy called pl Computer Play Shop. Um, one of the things we did, I didn't find a picture of this, is we had the, the kids draw a picture at the beginning and at the end of the course. And the requirement, only requirement for the picture is there had to be a person and there had to be a computer in the picture. 
And my goal, my, my intended outcome, and you don't always get your intended outcome, was that in the beginning, the computer would be huge and the people would be small. And in the end, the person would be bigger than the computer. And that's what I wanted these kids to learn. And it, it worked. <laughs> um, we did teach programming. We wanted them to at least get to the point where they could make the computer say, hello world, or their name. <coughs> Hi, my name is so-and-so. Uh, we used basic and pilot language, which is a text processing language. Um, one of the things that we did that a lot of the computer literacy people didn't do is we um, had the, the kids really explore careers in computing. And of course, they were different in 75 than they are, were ongoing. In some ways, it's going back to <laughs> what it was like in 75. But we did it. We had them interview people and make scrapbooks where the scrapbook had to have something that was written by a computer and something that was um, not written by, but, but printed by a computer. And we talked about what was comprehensible and what, was, what, was, what, what you should believe and what you shouldn't. Um, of course, in 75, there were almost no applications, but later on, computer literacy included, being able to use a word processor, being able to use a spreadsheet. Um, and today, my punchline for tomorrow is part of computer literacy today, since you don't have to go through all that rigmarole of turning it on, you just push the button, is can you use the applications? Another thing that we did that, um, that many of the contemporary people interested in com learning about computing and why we learn about computing um, talked about was um, the policy and govern governance. And again, that's a big issue today. How are we going to control these things? But in 75, 70, this, this little course took place in 76, we were already asking these kids to think about why we use these machines, what they can do, what they can't do, how do we govern them. Um, and I hope some of those folks, I haven't followed up with this particular group of kids. They were about 75 kids that took this course. Um, but I hope some of them are using what they learned in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade um, in thinking seriously about what we do with what we can do today. And then, of course, we did games and game boards. And, um, and I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the use of games. Um, we did, I did mention that it's the game and the, it was a motivation for doing something else so you could hide what you thought was educational material inside a game. But we did something different with it. Um, oh, here's, here's the part of the um, pretest. So, and in this particular, I picked one of the pretests where the, this particular kid got most of them wrong, a lot of them wrong. So um, he thought you had to be the smartest person in the class in order to get a job in computing. I hope we disabused him of that. Um, and then computers are usually used to solve the same problem over and over again, new problems each time, or problems with calculations no one knows how to do. I hope by the time that, that this particular young person learned how to program, he figured out that if you don't know how to solve the problem, you probably can't program the computer to do it either. Uh, yeah, well, this is 75, this is 76. Um, and my answer then was, um, same program, same problem over and over again. Um, now we've got enough applications, so maybe you can do new problems. Uh, and then this, this nine, question 19 is still sort of up for grabs. Would it be easier to program a computer to guide a rocket to the moon or to drive a car from school to my house? Um, we marked him wrong <laughs> at that point, but I was arguing with a friend of mine a couple of days ago, and they said, no, 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 no. That's the right, right, wrong answer, so you guys can argue about that one. So, games. Um, Battleships was one of the games that was easily available. It was programmed in BASIC, but the program for Battleships is very complicated. Um, we had the kids play the games that they wanted to play without a computer and without a plastic game board first. They had to draw the game board. We wanted them to understand the interaction between the logic of the game and the game board itself. When, if we just turned people loose with said program a game, they t spent all their time programming the game board and didn't even think about the logic of the game play. 
And when kids are doing, using Scratch today, you'll find the same thing happening. Um, so then we had them play with, with a plastic game board. And having had the experience of making the game board themselves, they begin to think about the difference between the background and the game. Um, and then we had them play on the computer. And, and at that point, when they're playing on the computer, they, um, they get to have the computer be the game board and the rule enforcer, but not the opponent, or to have the computer be the uh, component. And by the time we got there, they could understand those distinctions. And these are 10, 11, 12-year-olds. Um, today's, of course, today's 10, 11, 12-year-olds. That's kindergarten for them. Um, easier game was the game of Herkel, which was already being used in paper and pencil in schools. And we did the same thing with this game and had them play it paper and pencil and graph paper. And then um, we, sh we could then show them the program. And three or four of these, um, of, the, of the line items in the program, they could read the whole program. Some of the logic they understood, some of it they didn't. If you look at line uh, 420, um, we really wanted to get them to the point where they could make the computer say something, wait for input, and then respond. Um, that was as far as we got. But that's enough to get the idea that the computer does what it's told most of the time. Even if you didn't tell it to do it, somebody else did. And that's really key uh, to what we felt was computer literacy. So there's what it is on the computer. Um, so, I've gone through this really quickly. Um, in 1970, um, there was just beginning to be timeshare. And we got from timeshare to 1995, personal computing was really um, not, certainly not ubiquitous, but the idea that you would have a computer in your home um, was well advertised and much of the world com personal computing was available. Typewriter graphics to high resolution graphics went on. Um, we're High resolution graphics actually existed in this early, in the early period here. Um, vector graphics and a lot of, of beautiful stuff. Um, uh, there was a magazine called Computers and Humanities that was um, very popular, but it was academic. It was popular in the academic community, in people in computing, for people in computing. It wasn't. Um, part of everyday life at all. Um, and people had no real idea how to distinguish between what was computer generated and what was um, put into the computer by a person, was human generated, and the computer was merely the vehicle for displaying it or printing it. Um, and again, the being literate meant, in many ways, being able to distinguish that. We had a, uh, one of the kids in the computer play shop came up to me um, and he said, said, Ms. Liza, how did the little person get into the television set? How did they get that person to be so small? Um, that that level of not understanding the techniques, I hate the word technology because that means the study of technique, um, but, but not understanding the techniques, not understanding what's behind what they see, um, left a lot of people completely vulnerable to the idea that if it was written by a computer, if it was printed by a computer, if it had something to do with a computer, computers don't make mistakes. Therefore, it was believable. And I felt that it was really important that people, that myth get um, dispelled so that we would not be the victims of the people who were the programmers and the owners of the computers. And we would not end up 
vulnerable to the bank teller telling you, well, you can't have your money because the computer won't let me do it. I wanted our students to be able to say, then you need a manual process. We have to be able to do what we have to do. We are not the slaves of the computers. That was an issue in 1975, just as much as it is an issue today. Um, we had first community memory, was one of the very first public access file sharing activities. Lee Felsenstein put that together in the early 70s in Berkeley. Then we had the well uh, that Stuart Brand put together. There was a, a, um, a conferencing system called Planet that was put together by the Institute of the Future. Uh, so there were um, a lot of early conferencing and, and um, internet activities going on, even in the 70s. But again, they weren't available to everybody. Um, I'm not going to actually look, say much about the next period, the 1995 to 2020. Um, Jerry, the last speaker, covered that area um, really nicely. Um, but certainly we went from mosaic uh, to Chrome in terms of web browsers. Um, I cheated a little bit on the next one because Eliza was earlier than this period, but Eliza was actually the first interactive program that I ever interacted with, and I was delighted to find out that Weizenbaum had used my name. Uh, <laughs> and of course today kids have Alexa. But we have to ask how, do, do, do they, re just like the little boy who didn't know how the, the little man got into the television set. He had no idea of the technology that produced television images. I think there's a lot of people today who have no idea how Siri and Alexa and, and these talking um, avatars, AIs, how they work, how reliable they are, um, and what... Uh, what we can do with them, um, and whether they should do what they're told by them. Uh, in, in some senses, this uh, trip for me from California has been an exercise in computer disaster, in the sense that I got to the airport at, uh, in San Francisco, went to register on the kiosk, and... Um, the kiosk, and when I tried to get my baggage tag, said, your flight's been delayed. You're going to miss your, con your um, connection in Atlanta, so reschedule. And by the way, there are no flights that get in before 5 o'clock in the morning. And I had spent hours making sure I got a flight that wasn't a red eye. Um, so here's, here's my computer literacy. That don't believe what the computer tells you. So I went to the person at the counter and they called it human intervention, or, or age, agent intervention. <laughs> um, and uh, said, you know, what do I do? Please fix this for me. He said, well, actually, you've got 40 minutes. That <laughs> you're going to make your connection. Don't worry about it. Just go get on the plane. Um, for me, that's what computer literacy, and it's the old-fashioned computer literacy, did for me. Um, we've gone from Napster to, to YouTube, um, so we all know how to file share now, we all know how to do send email, which is fancy file sharing. Um, most of us can make a video recording from our computer in our pocket that happens to have a phone app on it. Not our, not our phone, it's not a phone. <laughs> um, and can record something, we can send it to our friends, we can record it so anybody can pick it up that we open it up to. Um, and of course we've gone from Yahoo and the first vestiges of the World Wide Web into uh, TikTok. And uh, who knows what the future will be of that. I, I have another um, unfortunate story which I didn't, I mean, the, the one in the airport I was able to solve, but the one on my uh, 
map program in my rental car, I was not able to solve. It started, it, it, actually the problem started with the car thinking it was smarter than I am and telling me that the tires were flat. <laughs> uh, and it, it had all the way from Philadelphia to here and then up to the, um, the ferry station, it was going bong, 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 bong. I had no idea how to turn that off. Um, I, I filled the tires, it stopped for a while, and now it's telling me the tires are flat again. I tried to turn on the Google Maps to get the information for how to follow the horrible roads here, um, and tried to use Apple, what, CarPlay, to synchronize the screen in my car with the screen on, uh, on my phone. It worked for a while. It worked for a day and a half. And then it stopped moving the location. So I got this wonderful display of uh, where I was a half an hour ago. <laughs> and then I would have to pull over because I can't look at my phone and be driving in, with any kind of safety, pull over if I could get off the road, um, s and go back and forth between um, my tiny screen looking at, uh, at the next turn and how to, get, how to operate the clover leaf to orienting myself for where I am, which town is next. Um, it, it's been a nightmare. I'm hoping that um, the computer literacy is actually going to help us deal with, first of all, the garbage in, garbage out issue. If we're really computer literate, um, we know that a person has put the program into the computer. We know that if it doesn't work right, there's no point in blaming the computer. You have to blame the programmer. We have to know that when we talk to the bank teller or the community, the, the um, agent helper, uh, first of all, we have to recognize when it's a bot and it doesn't really have much information. Then we get a, a person and we have to recognize that that person is um, looking at the same information that we're looking at and they don't really know any more than we, have to, than we do. We have to then escalate and say, get me somebody who knows something because I wouldn't be talking to you at all if the computer documentation was good enough. Um, and then we have to say to that supervisor that we finally got who still can't solve the problem, well, you and I are on the same side. We are the consumers and we need the people who are controlling the programming of this computer to improve that programming. It's not good enough. It's not serving us. That's why the, both the careers and the policy making is such an important part of computer literacy. If we don't understand that the computer is not in charge and we don't take charge, then we will be the victims of the people who do own the computer. And so it's, it's really important to start that um, in early learning. So our two-year-olds and three-year-olds, they know how to make the computer do stuff. They can run the applications, but they don't yet know how to take control of that computer and make it do what they want. Uh, and that's what they learn at this point. That's the literacy in elementary school is they learn to, to use the computer as a tool and make it do what they want. Then they still need to learn to use their own citizenship and their own power as a participant in our society to, um, to make sure that the computers are doing what we want. And I want to finish the formal part of this with the second part that since 75, I've been saying that the truly computer literate person is the person who knows when to turn the damn machine off. <laughs> Thank you. We can have questions.
discuss anything you want. We have, according to this monitor, unless it's lying to me, we have 18 minutes. Yeah, go ahead back in the back. This, no, I think you're underestimating the impact of Usenet has on expanding the conversation and expanding the literacy. Yes. For many people, it was the first time we were able to interact with people all over the globe on specific topics and words for them. It was huge. Yeah. Does everybody here know what Usenet was? Okay. Cause, because. It all right. Is. It still is, but. Uh, it, yeah, but. but <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I don't use it anymore, um, but I, you're right. And it's one of the, the disasters of trying to put together a talk like this is it's like, well, am I gonna go off on a sidetrack? Am I gonna, what do I include? So thank you, that was, that's great. There's a, there's, and this is the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Actually, let me just add, since I have plenty of time, um, one more thing that I didn't put in the slides. Um, History of Computing and Learning and Education, which is hcle.org is a virtual museum on the history of computing and learning and education. And I didn't put it together because I wanted to say I'm wonderful. I put it together because this whole movement of the use of computing for learning started with probably 5,000 people. It's a big world, 5,000 people isn't very many. And I wanted to sing the praises of those people. So that's, it's, it's a platform for all of you. You all have examples and ideas and things in your attic, your basement, your back of your desk drawer, which are artifacts from the history of, of how we used computing for learning. All of that we can put on this platform in this virtual museum. The, putting the, the scanning the artifact is just the first piece. The most important part is in the interpretation. So if you have a piece of the history of computing in, for, that, was, that you can connect with somebody learning something. It doesn't matter whether it's learning programming or learning how to build a computer. It can be hobbyist stuff too, or something that was used in schools. We'd love to have your picture and your curation, your explanation of why this, this image is um, significant. Um, and we'll cite you, but this is a project I started in 2000 as a garage cleaning um, activity because I was overwhelmed with stuff that I hadn't thrown away since 1975. Um, and I can't finish it. I, I, along with the book, I need your help to do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not a distraction. <laughs> Um, and, and I have to start out by saying I didn't know my father very well. So I have a few, um, uh, a few anecdotes. Um, but that's part of the history that, that I would love to see researched. Um, he was, his mother made him be a doctor. He wanted to be an engineer and he wanted to go to MIT. His mother wouldn't let him and made him go to Columbia Medical School instead. So what he did was uh, get... Uh, to go to um, Mass General Hospital to do his residency, <laughs> which was next door to MIT, and uh, snuck over to MIT and actually became an engineer. Um, so um, what I know is that there are family stories that he was working on a uh, computer called Ollie's Folly, and he was working with Norbert Wiener and Jerome Wiseman. Um, Weisman, um, in their lab, which was called the Rad Lab, I think, at the time. Um, there's only a little bit of documentation that I can find. And again, his name was Oliver, Oliver H. Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S. Um, I found a couple of pictures and just a few references. Um, it, he was a crazy man. People either loved him or hated him. Uh, and uh, he did work on, also they were working on the cesium clock, the atomic clock. And I think there was a good deal of interaction between the lab work, between the two of, of those activities. Um, he subsequently did a lot of military work. He worked on the Nike system. Um, and we haven't been able to uncover the classified documents for that yet. But um, 
when we talk about different kinds of literacies, I'm going to keep this from being a distraction by bringing it back to something that I think is, is really important for us to, to take into consideration. For a lot of us, we remember the conversations that were going on around um, our childhood. And I think not only did I not talk about Usenet, but we often don't talk about um, the influence, the family influence that happens and what we become. We, we either get are, are sort of feels like instinctively interested in stuff that was part of our family culture or we're in total rebellion against it. And we don't want to do anything like that and we go out and do something entirely new. Um, I've been lucky I've been able to integrate psychology and sort of recovering from the family trauma and some of the technical, but both my parents were technical and uh, very interested in logic and general semantics. And I grew up with everybody reading science fiction, dinner table was, conversation was, well, what would it be like if we could move faster than the speed of light? Would we be able to watch ourselves landing in the rocket ship after we'd gotten to the planet? Um, so I'm sure that had a big influence on my being interested in, in this. And when we talk about everybody becoming computer literate, one of the things we don't think about um, is that um, people grow up in families that are analytical or not analytical. I mean, for those of us who are analytically oriented, we call not analytical magic. Uh, <laughs> So um, when we want to encourage computa computational thinking or we want to, uh, or, or systems, dynamic systems thinking, which is my word for it, it's bigger than computational thinking, I think, um, we need to take into account the background of the person we're talking to. Because for one person, this is what they cut their teeth on and their parents required that they do analytical thinking. For another, and, and they learned it the, the way we now learn to use paper and pen, pencil and crayons. Um, for another person, um, this is a new way of approaching the world. And they've never done this kind of analytical thinking before. I'm working with African refugees at this point, And this is a big issue right now um, that they are at these folks are worrying about where their next meal is coming from. And they have an, uh, an iPhone in their pocket or a smartphone in their pocket. So how do they think about this device? How do they think about what, um, what's going on in the world? Um, an awful lot of uh, do-gooder folks, uh, the aid community, wants to go in and teach them coding because somehow they think that will prepare the next generation for, quote, jobs in the 21st century. But they're leaving out the fact that there's no connectivity. So even if they learn how to code, um, how are they gonna do it? They're not gonna do it on the internet because they can't afford to buy the connect, if the little connectivity there is, is very expensive. Um, 45% of the sort of 20 to 35 year olds in South Africa are unemployed. There are no jobs in coding unless you are like the basketball star in the top 0.5% of the skill level. Um, so it seems to me that just teaching these guys to code is, uh, and guys and girls, it's not just guys, um, is really giving false hope but teaching them systems thinking, teaching them garbage in, garbage out, teaching them to, to govern themselves and govern the machines around them, um, I think creates, and, and teaching them to, to understand how systems work. So the computer, the standalone computer, the little personal computer with the programming language becomes that laboratory that we were using it for in 1975 and 76. Um, these, these machines, they don't even have a programming language on them these days, or to find it, you have to go and connect to the internet. 
so those are, those are big issues that uh, I think we need to deal with. Any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned at one point uh, some similarity of jobs in 1975 coming up for jobs today. Yeah. On that? Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, Tim O'Reilly, who started O'Reilly Books, has a book called uh, WF, what the fuck, um, WTF. Uh, but his, it really stands for What's the Future. Um, it's a combination of, anybody read that book? It's really, it's really interesting. I, I recommend it. It's a combination of his memoir. There's a lot of name dropping. I had lunch with this guy and that guy. Um, but there's also some very profound thinking on it, in it. And of course, one of the things he says is that we will not ever have to program again. We will um, be managing the AIs that are doing the programming. And I've maintained from the beginning that although, that, that the reason why I wanted to teach programming with the computer literacy was for this garbage in, garbage out, understanding that at a gut level. Um, so again, it's like, well, do we have to, are we going to be the next Van Gogh? Are we going to be creative? What's the difference between the creativity that humans have and the creativity that computers have? Um, both of them look creative, but there are some very significant differences. So I think that, I mean, the short answer to that is, the, the jobs that there will be for people are the, the things that computers can't do. But understanding what computers can and can't do is really, really subtle. Uh, and it's very easy to say, oh, this computer is so creative. Well, there's some, some reasons why the AIs appear to be creative, and I would call it simulated creativity, not human creativity. Uh, I think the other thing, and this is sort of stealing for tomorrow's talk, um, is that uh, is a question of how we distribute our wealth. Um, right now, we have a um, a society, a global society, where for the first what hundred thousand years of human existence, we've evolved in a uh, an area of scarcity. Humans have had to use a high percentage of their energy to provide themselves with the basic necessities of surviving. If we are at an inflection point, and I think we are, and we can bring in an age of abundance, then we have to learn to live with that. And we don't know how. We are terrified of what it would be like if we couldn't get our identity from our jobs. Um, and, and actually in wasn't 75, it was 80, let's see, no, it was earlier than 75. Um, in the 60, 66, 67, I had a job at Shipley Chemical Company, which was the com company that invented plating through holes on PC boards. Um, and I, when I wasn't working hard, I was a quality control technician. Um, when I wasn't working hard, I would go around and I would, at the time there was a um, TV program called The Millionaire, where the millionaire knocks on your door and then it tells the story of what happens to this person after they win the lottery. And it wasn't the lottery, it was Publishing Clearinghouse, it's Millionaire. Um, and I would go around and ask people what they would do if somebody just handed them a million dollars. And a lot of people said, I would just keep on working. This is, this is who I am and what I am. And if we can't get beyond that, we're not going to be, we're, we're, we are really looking at a problem because we have the tools today. We've spent 500 years developing labor-saving devices and we haven't spent a whole lot of time asking what are we saving that labor for? Okay, any other questions? Yeah.
Oh yeah. Actually, if you, you I, I agree 100%, thank you. That's good, we're, we're on the same roadway here. If you look at the um, UN Sustainable Development Codes and their education description, they're educating us so, they, they say the objective is educating kids, people so they can get a good job. And as long as we keep that mentality, it's not Again, my personal opinion, this is not sustainable. I've been saying since 1975, coding is garbage collection. It's modern garbage collection, and we're not gonna have to do it forever. Yeah. So just to kind of further on that comment, mm -hmm. Dynamic systems analysis. Actually, they teach uncritical thinking. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and again, talking about this to this particular audience is preaching to the choir. So, uh, you know, we can, we can all, uh, I'm, it's really, this is an invitation for you to join me in trying to get this message out um, to the rest of the world. We've been playing with this stuff, and we know garbage in, garbage out. So please feel free to get in touch with me and let's, let's make sure we're ready for what's coming. Thank you.